This original WSRE presentation is made possible by viewers like you. Thank you. The economic landscape in Northwest Florida is changing. Some areas are in the midst of a veritable renaissance. What's driving it? And what does the future look like? We'll get analysis from leading experts on this edition of In Studio. Over the past decade and a half, the Northwest Florida economy has had much thrown at it. The devastating Hurricane Ivan, the financial and real estate crisis, which played especially hard in the state of Florida, and the BP oil spill. But through it all, the area has been resilient and in many ways seems to be reinventing itself. On this edition of In Studio, we'll examine the growing and evolving Northwest Florida economy with a panel of three experts who have great insight into the changes the region is experiencing. It's hard to have a much more balanced career than that of Don Gates. He is an accomplished businessman and entrepreneur with an impressive resume in public service, serving at both state and local levels. He was the Okaloosa County Superintendent of Schools from 2000 to 2006. From 2006 to 2016, he represented District 1 in the Florida Senate. He would ultimately become President of the Florida Senate. Just recently, Gates was appointed to the Florida Constitution Revision Commission. He's also done a pretty good job of passing on the public service gene. His son, Matt, is a United States congressman in Florida's first district. Dr. Rick Harper is one of Florida's most respected and sought after economists. He is the former director of UWF's Haas Center and recently served as senior policy advisor for economic affairs for the Florida Senate. Over the years, he has held a variety of roles at the University of West Florida, including executive director for the Office of Economic Development and Engagement, associate vice president for research and economic opportunity, and his current position, associate professor in the Department of Marketing and Economics. Dr. Harper has both a master's degree and a Ph.D. in economics from Duke University. Dr. Bryce Harris is assistant vice president for the Center for Research and Economic Opportunity at the University of West Florida. Dr. Harris has focused his career on economic, political, and military affairs. His past experience includes time put in as defense and space coordinator in the executive officer of the governor of Florida. He has a master's degree in defense and strategic studies from Missouri State University and a PhD in politics and international relations from the University of Reading in the United Kingdom. Gentlemen, welcome and thank you for joining us. Thanks. Thanks. Good to Thanks, be here. Sir. I'm going to begin with you, Dr. Harper. Take me back. It, it seems to me, anecdotally speaking, that the Northwest Florida economy really started to change and remake itself after Hurricane Ivan. Would that be an accurate assessment? Well, I think that's accurate. Uh, we've actually seen a lot of change just in the last couple of years. But if you look back to uh, a generation ago or to before Hurricane Ivan, uh, we really were uh, a part of the country that had... We had manufacturing much more than the rest of Florida. Uh, we were a military hub and continue to be so. But relative to 15 years ago, we've seen uh, uh, stagnation in job growth in our traditional sectors of strength, uh, manufacturing and military. And those jobs and that job growth has really been replaced by education, healthcare services, uh, retiree services, and we're starting to look more like the rest of Florida. Uh, the median age of households in Northwest Florida has increased over the last couple of decades until we now have uh, many more retirees than we used to as a share of our population, and that gets reflected in the type of jobs that get created. So we're looking more like uh, the, the hanging down part of the state uh, than we used to and uh, looking less like those traditional jobs, although, uh, we've done well in the BRAC process, base realignment and closure, right, right. relative to other communities in the nation. We still uh, have a very large and, and vibrant military sector. It's just not growing. The rest of the economy is growing up around it. And I was going to ask you that. Is the military part of our economy still as important as it, as it used to be? I mean, you're Okaloosa County, Eglin Air Force Base there. Uh, what are your thoughts on that, Senator Gates? Well, I, I think that for a long time, Northwest Florida has been a two-trick pony when it came to the economy. Obviously, the military and all of the vendors that feed the military, the suppliers, uh, and then the hospitality and tourism industry. But we found out, getting back to your question, that after hurricanes and after oil spills, 
uh, the, the, the tourism or hospitality part of the economy, the real estate part of the economy that relates to that, can be brought to its knees pretty quickly. And we also have found out that if somebody in the Pentagon gets the sniffles, we can get pneumonia mm. in terms of our military community. Uh, I, I would agree that, that we've been well treated in the BRAC process in the last BRAC, but I believe that there's another BRAC that is in effect happening now already, whether it's called BRAC or not. And I believe with the new administration in Washington, we've already seen the president uh, talking about cost overruns in the F-35. I think we're going to see another more formalized BRAC process, and, and that will affect, I think, the basic, fundamental, stable industry in northwest Florida now, and that's the military. You know, the, the real change that, uh, that we're looking for and hoping to encourage is more economic diversification so that we can become at least a three-trick pony, if not a four-trick pony, to make sure that if something terrible happens in nature uh, or if something uh, unforeseen or uh, unexpected happens in Washington, that we're not uh, a victim of somebody else or something else, but that we can be masters of our fate. That's the importance of economic diversification and the importance of the great work that these two economists have done to help lead the diversification of our economy in, in Northwest Florida. Dr. Harris, if we were to get hit by uh, downsizing militarily through BRAC or, or something along those lines, do you think we are better prepared today than we would have been, say, a decade ago? I think the, <clears throat> the answer to that question is without a doubt, uh, in no small measure due to the stewardship of esteemed public servants that we have, such as in President Gates and his time leading the Senate, uh, through the establishment of the Florida Defense Support Task Force mm -hmm. and the allocation of appropriate funding for those sorts of measures. You know, as the senator just mentioned, we are subject day in and day out to what some folks have referred to as the silent BRAC process. It does not take an act of Congress actually to initiate the realignment or closure of military programs, projects, and activities at any installation across the country. It just so happens that through the stewardship of leaders that we have experienced here and been so fortunate to have had, and President Gates and others across uh, the, the state government, uh, that we have been well positioned to stave off a number of the assaults, if you will, from competitor communities, as it will, uh, within the context of a formalized BRAC process. And so, as I am led to believe, that, as the senator just referenced, another official round of BRAC is very likely coming. Uh, this time, it's very likely to focus on the closure side of the equation and less so on the realignment side of the equation because of cost efficiencies that were not realized during the last go-round almost a decade ago. And so I do believe that, in fact, uh, through the leadership, through the efforts of staving off encroachment, through the public-private partnerships that have taken place on a specific per-project basis uh, across the installations here in the Panhandle, and through, quite frankly, the involvement of uh, one of the most preeminent cultural and economic engines that we have in this region, being the University of West Florida, mm -hmm. that we are as a region as, and as a community well positioned uh, to come out on the, the, the positive end of the next BRAC process. I was going to ask, do you think, perhaps, and I'll, I'll direct this at you, Dr. Harper, do you think that we might in this area benefit from, say, base closures elsewhere that might be added into Whiting or Eglin or, or Naval Air Station Pensacola? You know, there's there's been actually a fair amount of work in the <clears throat> academic literature about the effects of BRAC. Uh, the BRAC 2005 was actually the fifth round of base realignment and closures that we've seen. And there's been some study, some attention devoted to uh, reuse of those resources. And if you look at um, the BRAC process, you know, some of the uh, properties in California particularly are extraordinarily valuable for alternative uses. Uh, that's certainly been suggested for some of our real estate in Northwest Florida. Of course, we hope we don't have to face that possibility, but BRAC doesn't necessarily spell disaster for communities that have to repurpose those resources. Some of our most potentially valuable res resources are tied up in uh, beachfront properties, whether it's with uh, 
Eglin Air Force Base due to the tremendous asset, which is the Eglin Gulf Range uh, mm -hmm. that necessarily involves beach property. Same thing with uh, Naval Air Station Pensacola. You know, the fact that those properties were tied up saved us in Northwest Florida from a lot of the real estate uh, bubble and bursting process that uh, downstate saw because their beachfront properties, uh, you know, uh, zoomed up in value and then crashed uh, and burned. So, and yes. I think there are some opportunities for us uh, to expand uh, the military presence in Northwest Florida. The whole area of cyber warfare. Mm -hmm. I think we're well positioned with IHMC, uh, with other work that's being done mm -hmm. at the University of West Florida, and with work that's being done on our current military installations to become if not the leader, certainly one of the key leaders in cyber warfare research and, uh, and testing uh, in the world. Yeah, I think you bring up an interesting point. Uh, it, it, are, are there other things being done in the area, to your knowledge, to be able to uh, try to attract companies that are affiliated with cybersecurity and very high-tech type stuff? Well, absolutely. Uh, not only are there efforts that are taking place uh, within the community, but most importantly, there are organic efforts that are arising from within not only the Department of Defense, but other three-letter agencies, such as the Department of Homeland Security. Uh, we witness that, I do believe, uh, with the expanding presence of DHS, Department of Homeland Security, for example, at the uh, Corey Station, uh, formerly Center for Information Dominance, now uh, Center for mm -hmm. Information uh, Warfare Training. And that, I believe, is going to be a pattern that continues, particularly given the fact that we have very interesting and unique geographic specific assets that uh, include not only our position geopolitically in the region, but also with the infrastructure that has been laid over the decades by uh, the federal government as well as state and local government uh, that provides the backbone, if you will, for the uh, what was once known as the information superhighway, uh, uh, now the etherwebs or whatever they call it today. <laughs> uh, and so with that in mind, uh, I, I do believe, uh, coupled also with the, the extraordinary efforts both by uh, the local uh, base uh, command, uh, and I say local uh, in reference here to NAS Pensacola, but certainly that extends over to Whiting and to Hurlburt and to Eglin and to NSA Panama City uh, to really uh, formulate these public-private partnership opportunities to target uh, specific areas of growth that not only contribute to the national security of the United States of America, but also have the ancillary effect of leveraging our intrinsic assets, both knowledge-based and, and uh, physical assets. One of the things, Jeff, that I think we've all learned is that just like a lot of decisions about corporate relocation right. happen at the dinner table as well as the board table, right. where right. people make decisions about where they want to be and where they want to live and where their children are going to go to school. So I think the military uh, is not unmindful of the kind of community that military personnel and their families move into. And one of the things that Northwest Florida has done very, very well is to become very military friendly. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, all of the uh, basic rudimentary things that you would expect, but then going beyond that with, uh, with extraordinary tax advantages, with extraordinary educational advantages, uh, advantages actually that were enshrined in law by Rick Harper when he, uh, when he worked as our senior economic advisor in the Senate. Um, making sure that as, as military commanders uh, elsewhere and as strategists and planners look at where to locate or where to stay, that all other factors being what they are, that we would always be the most welcoming, the most friendly, uh, the most military supportive location in the United States. And I think we're living up to that. There's more we can do. But uh, Florida, I believe, now can say that we're the most military friendly uh, state in the country and Northwest Florida is indeed uh, military friendly when you compare it to other places that military installations and missions can go. Hoorah. Well, there's 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 definitely something to be said for for that, and and they, the the proof is in the pudding, so to speak, because you see so many retired military folks come back and make their home here in Northwest Florida, whether it's in Escambia, Santa Rosa, or Okaloosa County. So something to be said for that. Fascinating conversation. We're going to continue on. We are uh, discussing what's going on with the Northwest Florida economy, the changing landscape, if you will. We'll continue in just a couple of moments. You're watching in studio on WSRE Television, PBS for the Gulf Coast. Back in a moment.
Join WSRE at Gulfaria Marine Adventure Park for PBS Kids and Family Day, Saturday, March 11th from 10 a.m. to 2 p.m. Meet your favorite PBS Kids characters. Enjoy crafts, a scavenger hunt, a bounce house, and discover all the fun that Gulfarium offers. See the dolphin and sea lion shows and explore the animal exhibits and aquariums. Bring your cameras, bring your kids. Don't miss it. Saturday, March 11th at Gulfarium Marine Adventure Park in Fort Walton Beach on Okaloosa Island. WSRE Public Television and the Escambia Elementary Principals Association congratulate these Shining Star Award recipients. These students were selected upon the basis of good citizenship and adherence to the core values adopted by the Escambia County School System. Equality, responsibility, integrity, respect, honesty, and patriotism. Congratulations to all of these outstanding students. Watching in studio on WSRE Television, PBS for the Gulf Coast, our guest, former Florida Senate President Don Gates, economist Dr. Rick Harper, and Dr. Bryce Harris with the University of West Florida Center for Research and Economic Opportunity. We're discussing the changing and growing Northwest Florida economy. Dr. Harris, you mentioned something before we went to break, sort of talking about the intellectual capital that we have here, much of that retired military. Um, what does that do for us as far as being able to attract those ancillary companies that might be connected to military bases? Does it make us a lot more attractive? Well, absolutely, I do. I, you know, I think what, what most folks uh, who study the economy and look at the dynamics of Northwest Florida and understand the military and how important it is not only to our nation but certainly to our region uh, do recognize the fact that there are intellectual assets that cannot be substituted for that are gained through service in the Department of Defense and through the military services. These are assets, intellectual, soft skills, hard skills, and otherwise that are not acquired through any other means. I mean, when you're looking at the fact that people are literally battle-tested and battle-proven, these are individuals who have the ability to make calculated decisions, take calculated risks under pressure, uh, weighing costs and benefits, and realizing the objectives at the end of the day that have been set before them by their employers or by the commander in chief of the armed forces. And in that respect, I think that they are second to none in terms of the, the horsepower intellectually and uh, workforce wise that uh, retired military and otherwise separated military personnel bring to our region. But even beyond that, I think, and perhaps uh, far more understated than what oftentimes should be, are their spouses and their mm. dependents. And the fact that there is so much intellectual capital, so much just sheer raw capability, uh, because at the end of the day, a warfighter is nothing without the support of his or her family members back home. And so we recognize that as a community, as a region, and as a state in Florida, that these are resources that should not only be coddled, but that should in fact be promoted. And we are proud in Northwest Florida to have had the opportunity under the leadership of such folks as former Senate President Don Gates 
to bring resources to bear to raise awareness uh, of these uh, intellectual and physical assets that we have in human capital uh, that really are a transformative uh, fixture within our regional economy. That's my opinion. Dr. Harper, you want to add to that? Yeah, the, the military is a fundamentally different place uh, than it was when President Gates and I uh, went to high school and graduated. The selective service uh, was in place. Uh, the the draft was in place in the military. War of 1812, as I remember. <laughs> <laughs> I wasn't going to go there. But um, the military were not well paid at that point. But uh, we discovered pretty quickly that to get people to stand in harm's way, you have to pay them a decent wage. And so uh, the people that come into today's military and now that we see retiring from today's military tend to be uh, well-trained, a lot of responsibility. The same thing has happened uh, economically speaking in the military that has in a lot of other industry sectors in the U.S. economy, which is the military delivers its mission with more technology instead of simply boots on the ground or extensive military bases. And so these people uh, may well have exceptional skills, and they may well be skills that uh, crosswalk very well into the private sector economy. And so people with a history of taking responsibility, with great skill sets, and so, yes, they're, they're extraordinarily valuable. But this is a system that has to feed itself. Uh, it's true that as we look at retired and separated military members and their family members, you've got a tremendous human asset. But that asset can leave or it can grow brittle and old on you pretty fast if you don't provide opportunities mm -hmm. for those people to actually work in productive jobs. So that's why it's really important to focus on BRAC. It's really important to focus on making sure that we preserve the military presence, the Defense Support Task Force that Dr. Harris talked about is so important. We're lobbying Washington all the time. We're putting our case forward to our members of Congress so that they can make the case for Northwest Florida. But the fact is, there are many areas in private industry that can benefit from a lot of the skill sets that Dr. Harris just described. Mm -hmm. And, and so part of the job here, I think, is to make sure that we're drawing other industries uh, that may spin off of the military presence or even be uh, remotely related to it, but require some of the same kinds of decision-making skills, scientific skills, technical skills. We've tried to change the laws of Florida to make sure that people who who want to develop those skills or keep their skills current have a chance to do so through our state universities and our state colleges uh, because if we have a workforce that's ready to roll it's easier to attract industry uh, they're interested in tax credits they're interested in whether or not somebody's going to build a rail spur they're interested in all those things but they're really interested in whether or not when they plant themselves in northwest florida there's a workforce ready to go to work so we have to continue to feed our asset with opportunities for our asset to work and that's uh, good jobs and I would say, if I may add please, to that, the, the fact that through these good efforts, uh, through Senator Gates and Dr. Harper and certainly our legislative delegation all the way up to the governor's office over these many years, uh, we are fortunate that we have had the support and the encouragement, as we so have, that leads ultimately to a full 25 percent of the University of West Florida student body has some affiliation to the military, whether that be retired uh, directly retirees, whether that be uh, spouses or dependents that are taking advantage of post-9-11 GI Bill benefits and the like, but I think that's important for a, a regional university such as UWF with a student body that is in excess of 12,000 uh, students that a full quarter of those uh, are actually connected in some form or fashion to the Department of Defense. How big a role do our uh, educational institutions in Northwest Florida, how big a role do they play in our success? I think it's critical. I think it's critical because, again, a lot of the decisions that are made about whether to go somewhere, whether to grow somewhere, are made at the kitchen table. Mm -hmm. And uh, I've been part of some of those decisions as we've developed uh, our own company across the United States. And I can tell you that the availability of good schools, uh, the capacity of those schools to provide special services when they're needed or special opportunities uh, when those opportunities can be taken advantage of are critical to families making decisions about relocating or staying in Northwest Florida. Uh, and so the quality of our schools and the reputation of our schools is vitally important. 
But the other thing is we've got to make sure that we're actually providing education and training that is lashed to the realities of our emerging economy. That's why it's so important, and again, this is something that Rick Harper uh, began years ago in working with us in Okaloosa Schools and then carried it through when he worked with us in the Senate, making sure that uh, there are opportunities in every single high school and now in middle schools all over Northwest Florida and indeed the state for students to earn national industry certifications mm -hmm. in, uh, in areas that the economy really values, everything from aviation to zoology, uh, 204, or actually 1,246 uh, individual uh, industry certifications right now so that students can, can have the skills that can make them marketable. So it's important that we have a quality reputation, but it's important that we impart real-world skills that can be useful uh, in keeping people here and in attracting businesses here. Elaborate on some of that, Dr. Harper. Well, you know, if you look at what businesses need to be successful, they, they've got to have plant and equipment. They have to have access to markets uh, to sell into. They have to have access to their input markets. But, you know, you can put the technology really anywhere in dozens of countries around the globe. You can have access to the financial capital you need to be successful anywhere uh, around the U.S. or around the globe. But what you uh, are stuck with as a community is really the uh, labor force that you have. And if you can build the skills of the people that uh, live and work in your community, uh, then you're going to attract the best capital. You're gonna attract the best facilities and you're gonna have the best businesses. So really the most important single thing you can do to ensure business success and high incomes for the people that live in your community is make sure that your workforce uh, has the skills that it needs to be competitive in a, in a 21st century economy. And, you know, that's got to start at uh, pre-K mm. or even before, and it's got to continue through university. So, yes, uh, in answer to your question, our university system is extraordinarily important, and we're lucky to have uh, state colleges and university and a university in our region that can provide that training. And I think that the focus that the legislature has taken under President Gates's leadership as, as well as uh, other people in Tallahassee towards making sure Florida has the best workforce it can possibly have is the single most important thing we can do for economic development. We're now leading the nation in, in um, uh, students in uh, high school and in college earning national industry certifications. And that's a certification that's granted by industry based on a student developing the skills that can put them right to work in that industry. Curriculum developed by industry, uh, instructors selected or trained by industry, uh, credentials awarded by industry. We're now the national leader in being able to do that. And it began here in Northwest Florida. Some of our counties in Northwest Florida are national leaders in providing this kind of training and education to our middle school and high school students. And some of our counties in Northwest Florida are lagging behind. And uh, believe me, if, uh, if I had a, a young child now instead of uh, older children, uh, I'd be checking to see how my counties are doing in making sure that my children would have the education and skills that really transfer into value in the real economy. And in fact, as a father of a young three-year-old just turned in December, I'm doing exactly that thing. Yeah. And so the questions ultimately arise, uh, you know, it, in my peer circles, uh, it, locally and regionally and certainly nationally, why do you stay? Why do you choose to stay in Northwest mm -hmm. Florida? Why? Did I, as someone who was born and raised in Pensacola in Warrington, who left for uh, you know bigger and greener pastures, why did I return back to Northwest Florida when I could have stayed uh, gone forever? And the ultimate answer to that is, well, it's because this is the greatest place on God's green earth that we could possibly have uh, available to us. And with the people, with the culture, with the geography, with the history, uh, and with the leadership and the storied vision that we now have um, that I think is transpiring across uh, uh, this great area, uh, that ultimately is a compelling factor for folks such as myself to come back and stay here and raise our own families. I think you hit on something that is uh, perhaps one of the major keys, the, the word vision. I think for the first time in many, many years, this area has adopted some level of vision greater than what it has been in the past. So. Um, 
be interesting to watch what happens. We've got more of this fascinating conversation to continue on here in just a couple of moments. We're talking about the Northwest Florida economy. We'll be back in just a few. We'll take a quick break. Thank you for watching in studio on WSRE Television, PBS for the Gulf Coast. PBS Kids, making sure free educational programs are accessible to all children across America. With the all new 24 seven channel, on TV and streaming everywhere, every child can watch PBS Kids shows. After school, after dinner, whenever, wherever. Watch WSRE PBS Kids beginning March 6th. Check local listings and go to WSRE.org to learn more. Unlock your newest member benefit. Over 1,000 episodes of your favorite PBS shows. American Masters. Antiques Roadshow. Nature. Nova. Masterpiece. Watch the best of PBS anytime, anywhere. Become a member, sign in, and start streaming today. Watching in studio on WSRE Television, PBS for the Gulf Coast. Our topic, the Northwest Florida economy. Our distinguished panel this evening, former Florida Senate President Don Gates, economist Dr. Rick Harper, and Dr. Bryce Harris with UWF Center for Research and Economic Opportunity. Uh, Senator Gates, I will ask you this question. Where do we stand as far as the BP oil spill money is concerned, the, the triumph money as it's known? Well, after the oil spill, which... Uh you know, occurred now uh, so many years ago that some people uh, don't even remember it if they didn't live here. They just yeah. hear stories about it. But it was a catastrophe uh, with greater potential for harm maybe than we even, even now know. Yeah. We don't exactly know what's on the floor of the Gulf of Mexico and what the future might bring. Uh, but, but as a consequence of that, obviously BP was forced to take responsibility. And under the Clean Water Act, which is a federal law, they were fined. And those fine uh, dollars, which were considerable, were spread among the Gulf states. And uh, our local governments have uh, planned to spend or spent uh, a number of them. And then a lot of businesses and individuals had claims. They made claims. A lot got paid. Some didn't get paid. But then on top of that, Florida's Attorney General Pam Bondi uh, sued BP for the state's economic damages, the damages that the state itself would suffer uh, and did suffer as a consequence of the oil spill. When, uh, when people lose their jobs and their businesses and economic activity goes down, then there's less tax revenue. Uh, there, that it has a ripple effect, and the state suffered uh, economic damages. And so uh, Pam Bondi sued. She got a $2 billion settlement. And before that suit took place, uh, we sponsored a bill, I sponsored a bill, uh, that said that if uh, Florida ever did receive any damages as a result of, uh, of that suit, that three-fourths of it would, uh, of the money, would have to come to Northwest Florida and be spent to uh, benefit and diversify our economy. And then a couple of years later, in 2013, uh, Speaker Will Weatherford and I crafted legislation, which again, Dr. Harper had a big hand in, in making sure that uh, we knew how that money would be spent, that it would not be frittered away uh, in local politics, mm -hmm. but instead we'd make tough, hard, good business decisions. There'd be return on investment calculations. There'd be, uh, uh, you know, clawbacks. Uh, there'd be all kinds of uh, rules and guardrails to make sure that money wasn't uh, spent in a fashion that was less than arm's length. So that the billion and a half dollars mm -hmm. that would come to Northwest Florida could really benefit our economy. Because it's a once in a lifetime, sure. hopefully, disaster once in a lifetime opportunity to recover from it. Uh, and so Triumph Gulf Coast was set up, it's a five member board, uh, and appointed by the constitutional officers of the state, by the Senate President, by the Speaker of the House, and they have the responsibility to, to look at good ideas and make sure that those good ideas uh, are properly funded if they meet all kinds of severe and strict criteria. 
much more uh, of a strict criteria set, frankly, than Enterprise Florida or the state of Florida itself has used with its economic incentives. Right. Much stricter, much stronger. Well, now we've, uh, the first $300 million of that billion and a half uh, is in the hands of, uh, of the chief financial officer, and he's ready to cut a check. But that requires that money, because it came into the state, to pass through the appropriations process. And, and so now in Tallahassee, there's, uh, there are decisions to be made about whether or not uh, uh, that money would be passed through uh, more or less as it was intended or whether there would be uh, additional strictures and structures added to it. And that debate and discussion is going on as we speak. Uh, our hope is that the original law will be adhered to. Obviously, there are improvements that can be made. Uh, and uh, we simply want to make sure that the money's not frittered away uh, somewhere else, but that we can use that money to build the human infrastructure, the physical infrastructure, and the job opportunities in northwest Florida so that we are no longer that two-trick pony, so that we truly have a diversified economy. It seems like the House bill is a little less friendly to us than, say, the Senate bill uh, of, of what's being kicked around right now. Am I accurate in, in saying that? Well, it depends on your perspective. Uh, <laughs> if you're a House member or if you're a senator. Um, senator Broxson and, uh, and Senator Gaynor and Senator Monford have sponsored a bill which basically says, look, this isn't taxpayer money. Mm -hmm. This is an economic damages claim. Uh, you know, somebody got sued and they paid, and so now the state is going to be the transmitter of that money from he who committed the sin to he upon whom the sin was committed, and that's the people in the economy of Northwest Florida. Uh, the, the House bill is, uh, is slightly more complex. It's much longer. Uh, it involves uh, a, a set of permissions and approval processes that, that gets Tallahassee uh, more involved in making decisions about Northwest Florida's economy. Uh, I believe that there will be a, a, uh, an agreement, an accommodation uh, between the House and the Senate on this matter. I have full confidence uh, in our legislative delegation that they all stand up for what's in the best interests of, uh, of the people who sent them there. So I think at the end of the day, we will have the benefit of those dollars as we should. And then, and then it's our responsibility to make sure that those dollars really do generate good jobs and economic activity that's lasting. Dr. Harper, what kind of potential can that bring us? Well, there's a lot of potential there. Uh, we have to uh, ensure that uh, the dollars that are spent in Northwest Florida, assuming that the legislature appropriates them as was intended by the statute originally, uh, they need to be in addition to normal state spending uh, that would occur here, whether it's for transportation projects or education projects, very worthwhile infrastructure, workforce development, uh, job creation sorts of things, because if we end up spending that money to build a bridge here or improve a roadway there or do a water project here, it's simply replacing money that should have come through the appropriation process out of uh, general revenue and other sources and, and should have been spent here. So I think that the Triumph Gulf Coast process itself is very important in seeing that that money really goes to offset the previous damages right. by creating extra opportunity on top of what a region of the state would normally get from the budget process and the, and the projects the state pursues. And one thing that I might mention is that in the same law, the Oil Spill Recovery Act, that set up this three-fourths of the money comes to Northwest Florida, uh, we also provided an immediate $30 million uh, uh, pump priming grant from state revenues to be used to, to help us get up on our feet. And that money was managed uh, by uh, these gentlemen. Uh, through the uh, the University of West Florida, and uh, you know, according to objective analysis, seven thousand jobs were created, a better return on investment than the state usually gets, uh, far less failure, uh, and a lot more success. So when you allow local people who are tied into the business realities of the area to make those kinds of investment decisions, it's better than having politicians. Uh, in Tallahassee or in Washington, uh, try to decide what's good for Northwest Florida. So this is, to some extent, a local control issue. Right. And if I may, just to, to piggyback on what Senator Gates is saying, that in fact, uh, that, that particular Oil Spill Recovery Act program uh, that Senator Gates sponsored, uh, in fact, as uh, he indicated, has led to the direct creation 
of more than 7,000 direct new jobs in our region, but the indirect and the induced effect of, of this program has actually led to about 28,000 jobs across the region that have been created and retained. We have had uh, nearly $750 million of net new capital investment to Northwest Florida that otherwise would not have come to this area. Uh, all of which were encapsulated in the context of a bill that Senator Gates sponsored and saw signed into law by the governor, which was intended for the charitable purpose of promoting an innovative economic development program that emphasized four things, research and development, commercialization of research, economic diversification, and job creation. And without, a, a, without any of that money explicitly going directly into the hands of local government, certainly not into the hands of state government, and also upon the same principle that these were to be subst uh, uh, supplemental dollars rather than substitutional dollars. And so uh, I, I'm, I, as a resident of Northwest Florida uh, and a taxpayer, I'm happy to see the efforts that are transpiring uh, to ensure that Northwest Florida is in fact made whole. Uh, and I hope that uh, we can continue to see that this legislation that was passed wisely so, so many years ago now, uh, with the money still sitting in the bank in Tallahassee will ultimately be made available for our region. Can make a huge difference from what you're telling us. Bottom line, that's, that's amazing that just the ancillary activity is created just from the jobs you were talking about. Something else that you did while you were in the Senate that has uh, received a lot of praise as it should, um, the new Bay Bridge or Three Mile Bridge. <laughs> what, what will that do for our economy? The fear, of course, uh, was that uh, uh, that a new bridge, which has to be built, would become a toll bridge. Mm -hmm. In fact, that was the uh, that was more than a rumor. That was, uh, I think, an informal plan. And uh, one of the uh, advantages of being president of the Senate is that uh, you can use your pen uh, to approve or disapprove uh, things occasionally. And I was asked to approve uh, a transportation plan for Central Florida uh, between legislative sessions. And I, uh, I uh, looked at the plan and said, uh, I don't see anything for Northwest Florida. And so we were able to convert a toll bridge into a bridge entirely paid for uh, by the state. Uh, some $650 million will be expended on that project. And, uh, and we'll have not only a functional bridge, but we'll also have, a, uh, I think, a, a, a very attractive piece of infrastructure uh, that will connect uh, the, uh, the community of Gulf Breeze uh, and uh, the community of Pensacola. Uh, the bridge is critical. Uh, if you put a toll up, I think that you would uh, it'd be like putting a tourniquet on people going back and forth to right. church and to school and to shop and to their jobs. So I think this is important. It's important to have infrastructure uh, that allows people to move back and forth in the economy. This was something that fortunately I was able to do, uh, ultimately with the concurrence of Speaker Weatherford and Governor Scott and, and the support of my colleagues on the Northwest Florida delegation. Very good. Exciting times across Northwest Florida. We're discussing what's going on with the economy and how it's changing. We'll continue our discussion in just a couple of moments. You're watching in studio on WSRE Television, BBS for the Gulf Coast. We're coming back in just a couple of moments.
This is in studio on WSRE Television, PBS for the Gulf Coast. Our guest, former Florida State Senate President Don Gates, economist Dr. Rick Harper, and from UWF Center for Research and Economic Opportunity, Dr. Bryce Harris. We're discussing the growing and evolving Northwest Florida economy. Um, Dr. Harris, you're from Pensacola. Um, you've seen the evolution of Pensacola. Let's talk about one of the areas that has really kind of turned into a, I guess, a shining light, so to speak. Downtown Pensacola has just changed, it seems like, almost overnight. What's going on? It seems like it, uh, certainly for those who may be newcomers to the area, but for someone who is pushing, well, perhaps I won't say exactly how old I am, but, uh, but who's been around for a few decades, uh, you know, I, I can remember in my lifetime when there was zero activity after dark down Palafox Street, where we had what was affectionately known as Old Stinky down on yeah. Main Street. Uh, which, you know, there was not enough vanilla incense in the world uh, for the brief period that they tried that, uh, that could have ever masked it, especially on a, uh, on a densely uh, a humid uh, night in August. Right. Uh, there was zero hope and optimism from uh, certainly my peers and friends and colleagues growing up in Navy Point and Warrington as to what the future would hold, and so everyone uh, would take parlor bets as to who can get out of town the quickest and stay gone the longest. And in fact, uh, I am happy to say that in the time that I have now uh, been back in Pensacola just before Ivan, uh, for, for good, bad, and indifferent, uh, that, uh, that there has truly been a renaissance. And I think Dr. Harper uh, hit upon it earlier that that truly can be, I think, a defining uh, turning point for, for Pensacola in particular and, you know, more broadly for Northwest Florida. Uh, with every uh, uh, crisis comes an opportunity. Uh, certainly for uh, rebuilding and uh, restructuring and uh, while we mourn uh, the loss of life and injury and property losses uh, at the same time when we move forward as uh, the enduring human spirit does then we find those opportunities not only to repair what was lost but also to exceed uh, our former expectations about ourselves and so uh, I think when you witness today in 2017, uh, where there is uh, an estimated $1 billion of new construction that is taking place in downtown Pensacola simultaneously, I think you can just witness the spike in concrete costs and steel costs you that are taking place. You said $1 billion? Billion with a B. Wow. And so, and, and it's not hard to imagine when you take the aggregate of all of the different construction, uh, renovation that's taking place, uh, you know, from east to west uh, and, and, and beyond. And so, you know, when you, and as I say, just take a look at what the current steel prices in this, this community and concrete prices are, and that tells you that the market is responding and telling us that, in fact, right now, demand is outpacing supply, as Dr. Harper is uh, more capable than, than anyone to, to address. Uh, and in fact, perhaps that's a good segue over to to Rick. Well, it's it's not just concrete and steel, but you should. We all hear the the contractors and uh, uh, builders talk about the price of uh, plumbing services and uh, framing services, and you know, there's also uh, some talk, some fear about the international trade environment. Uh, there's discussion of putting tariffs on imported uh, yellow pine from Canada uh, because their government engages in artificially low stumpage fees for mm. private contractors to take down trees and turn them into lumber. Yeah. And so if those tariffs go into place, then we could see uh, an increase in price uh, for lumber to build our houses. And given the strong demand that's already out there, uh, it's hard to get um, subs on the job is what I hear, and uh, now we're in a situation where you actually have to order materials well in advance for your construction projects. So yes, clearly we're seeing uh, the, the great side of investment in downtown Pensacola. Every great metro area has to have a, a thriving, robust, and interesting downtown to serve as its core. And I think Pensacola is coming on strong, and uh, 
when you hear uh, the older generation, and I certainly remember talking to uh, Professor Ella Bash about his childhood uh, in <laughs> Seville Square and how it was a place where you didn't ride your bicycle uh, mm -hmm. after dusk because uh, there was crime there, but downtown is thriving now, and uh, it's really at the core of a renaissance. It shows up in the data, the employment data that actually Pensacola added uh, the two-county metro area added about 4,000 jobs this past year, and whereas four or five years ago, uh, both Panama City and Fort Walton Beach were adding roughly as many jobs as Pensacola in every year, Pensacola in the last three years or so has really uh, jumped ahead. It's a bigger metro area in terms of population, and it's now adding jobs at a faster pace than surrounding metro areas, much faster than Mobile and somewhat faster than, Crest than uh, uh, Fort Walton Beach and Panama City. And as a recovering politician, let me say <laughs> that, that, that I don't think uh, uh, that the renaissance in Pensacola downtown Pensacola is due to some benighted government policy. Uh, I think it's due to visionary leadership in the private sector. Uh, I think it's due to risk, risk takers, uh, people who see an opportunity. Uh, I think it's tied to the arts community in Pensacola. Uh, you've got an extraordinary mixture of interesting and wonderful commercial establishments uh, as well as interesting and wonderful uh, arts opportunities mm -hmm. in downtown Pensacola. So those things are working together uh, without the need, I think, or, or without the harm uh, of a smothering government hand. So this is not because we politicians made something happen. It's because, you know, venture capital that is local capital and local risk takers and the arts community have done the right thing and, and they've had a wonderful canvas to paint on uh, in, in the architecture of uh, downtown Pensacola. And, and I know that there are, are many other folks involved in it, but I'm going to go ahead and say Mr. Studer, Quint Studer, has done a wonderful job of igniting things to, 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 to really get the, the city um, off and rolling. Leadership, and, is, leadership yeah. matters. Yeah. Leadership yeah. counts, yeah. and uh, whether it's in business or in any other area. And, and you know, Mr. Studer has been the spark plug. Yeah. There have been other people certainly who've done a lot and will do a lot, but, uh, you know, Quinn Studer is out there priming the pump in uh, downtown Pensacola's economy all the time, and I think that uh, he's taken some risks that other people wouldn't take. He's taken some criticism that other people uh, might not have been able to handle, but he's been successful. So, uh, you know, I wish we had a hundred more like him. Yeah. And, 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 and too, I think it's worth mentioning some of the uh, families and, and the foundations that have been involved with some of the nonprofit stuff. I think the, the Levin family, for example, a lot with IHMC and the, the YMCA. The Bear and the, Family the Bear Foundation. Family, uh, yeah. Mr. Lewis Bear and the, and the whole group. So a lot of people have really gotten on to, to, to get the situation ignited. Um, you mentioned for a second about the cost going up, Dr. Harper, and as we, as we look at the, the nation pretty much from a macro issue and, 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 and kind of start to listen to a little bit of what Chair Yellen is saying, you know, maybe you, you get a sense that, that inflation is starting to come back. For the longest time we were concerned about deflation, right. and, and now do you think that things are starting to, to reinflate? Well, the data say that inflation is clearly coming back. The Fed wanted some inflation because nobody wants to look like Japan, right. or increasingly uh, Europe looks like Japan yeah. with uh, deflation, asset prices falling, and that's really tough to recover from. But the health of the real estate market in Pensacola is exactly what the mature stages of a recovery look like. And, uh, you know, expansions sow the seeds for the next slowdown as prices go up, as concrete, steel, lumber, uh, uh, all the things that we've talked about, as those prices go up, then uh, real estate could become less affordable. Uh, when the Fed raises interest rates, as they inevitably will uh, in June, if not in March, uh, the FOMC will likely raise interest rates, then that's going to uh, put the affordable mortgages that we've gotten so used to over the past several years, uh, they're going to get uh, more expensive so that you could see payments. You know, if you go from a 2.5% mortgage up to a 3.5% mortgage, you might say, well, that's just one percentage point, but 1% on a base of 2.5, well, gosh, that's a big increase. Sure, uh, sure. And, and so there is that risk. Do, do you see a situation, though, the market has kept a, a little bit of a lid on uh, interest rates a little farther out the curve when we start sure. looking at 10. Do, do you see, because of maybe international demand and whatnot, perhaps, 
hopes that the the ten year maybe stays a little bit more uh, compressed and and maybe the the rise in mortgage rates would be a little slower. Well, it should be. There's certainly still a savings glut out there in the world economy. And increasingly, if you have a million dollars to invest, regardless of whether you're based in Dubai or in uh, anywhere around the planet, you're going to be looking to the U.S. because China is still a place of economic uncertainty, uncertainty about ownership and laws and what you really own. <laughs> and Europe is slowing down. And uh, so the place where you're going to get your return on investment in a stable and secure environment with a great infrastructure is still going to be the U.S. So, yes, we're still the cleanest dirty shirt in the closet. No gross line. <laughs> exactly. I've got less than three minutes. I always like to try to end, not that this hasn't been, because it's been a very positive program. But I want to end on a positive note and to get each one of you to give me what you're most optimistic about. I'm optimistic that we can diversify our economy with Triumph Gulf Coast and, and other activities that are going on. I believe that we will, you know, we have a hundred uh, manufacturing companies in Okaloosa County now, just on Okaloosa County. I believe the more we diversify, the more we uh, expand our economic base, the greater our, our, our future will be, and I think that's going to happen. A little less than two minutes, Dr. Harper. I think that uh, success begets success in some of the big projects that have been undertaken in downtown Pensacola and around the region are going to enable entrepreneurs who can't quite afford that scale of operation. You're going to see uh, uh, 12 plexes going up. You're going to see eight plexes going up funded by people who are uh, looking to piggyback on the increased migration and as our region becomes progressively more visible on the national scene because of the things that are happening, then that's going to create its own self-sustaining growth dynamic. So I'm excited about the growth that's occurring and think that it's going to become self-sustaining. About 45 seconds. <laughs> I would echo uh, what both of these gentlemen have said, uh, particularly with respect to the oil spill recovery efforts with Triumph Gulf Coast and assuming that the balance of that legislation uh, that is currently in Florida statute remains in place, then the idea that we could leverage that ultimate $1.5 billion against a one-to-one -one private sector match that could then be leveraged once again with the impending new President Trump's uh, infrastructure mm -hmm. stimulus plan, then I think that alone offers one of the single biggest opportunities that this region and certainly any other region I think in this country could ever have hoped to experience. Gentlemen, thank you so much. Wonderful conversation, wonderful dialogue tonight. Here's the bad part about it. You probably got yourself an invitation back sometime again in about a year, okay? <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> thank you so very much. Our guests this evening have been former Florida Senate President Don Gates, economist Dr. Rick Harper, and from UWF Center for Research and Economic Opportunity, Dr. Bryce Harris. We greatly appreciate all of their expertise and insight that they uh, provided us this evening and uh, certainly enjoyed the discussion about the changing Northwest Florida economy. I hope you enjoyed our broadcast. Thank you so very much for watching. I'm Jeff Weeks, wishing you all the very best. Take great care of yourself. We'll see you soon. Good luck.